there a way of turning off that alarm? When you get old, you sometimes wonder if you're hearing things. Because it's real. Okay, let me just get started. I want to thank you all for coming. Um, it's always a pleasure to speak at, at JNU with this very long history of student activism and politics and engaged scholarship as well. Uh, times are not what they used to be, of course, but uh, we'll do our best. The uh, topic that I was given to speak on is called market socialism. And my sense is, in giving lectures on Marxist theory, on socialism, and politics, and media, that this is not an idea that is especially widely studied or even perhaps understood within the student left right now. Um, so what I thought I would do is present an argument as to what the motivation might be for proposing a market version of socialism, and then the plumb the depths of what it entails, what it actually might mean, and then see if we can open up a discussion to see what people think of it. The, the left today is weaker than it's ever been during the course of its entire history. Uh, you might say that the socialist left, that is the desire to see some alternative to capitalism, is seeing a revival. So you wouldn't know it in India, but in the rest of the world it's happening. And the revival is motivated, I think, in large part, by the way that capitalism has been organized over the past 30 and 40 years and the effect that it's had on people's fortunes. But while the socialist left is, you might say, resurgent, Marxism is not. In fact, if you think of Marxism as the theory that guides socialist practice, the practice is coming back online. The theory, however, has been largely abandoned, not just by the intelligentsia, it was never adopted or embraced by the intelligentsia as a whole, but for the first time in the history of the left, Marxism is no longer the adopted theory of people who call themselves radicals. But radicalism is mostly now uh, either explicitly lined up against Marxism through such things as cultural theory or post-colonial theory or something, or various forms of identity politics, whether they're race, ethnicity, or gender, or sexuality. So the problem with that is that the socialist movement doesn't have much of a theory to guide it, insofar as Marxism was the only theory that put class politics at the center, and socialism is nothing if it's not the pursuit of class politics. One side effect of this is that discussions around possible models of socialism have now <coughs> declined to the point of non-existence. And that is a problem because you cannot encourage or urge people to fight for socialism if they don't know what it is. There's a widespread disillusionment with the received model of socialism, which is planning, central planning, but not much of an argument or a debate around what we might have instead of in its place. That's where we are right now. And that's why I think a serious, careful um, debate and argumentation around the possibility of market socialism is absolutely essential to the left because it gets us closer to being able to tell people what it is that we are fighting for, we would like people to be fighting for. As I said, the reality today is that capitalism on a world scale is the slowest growing we've seen in almost a century. Incomes have been stagnant in most of the advanced world, much of the other developed world, and India is one of the few countries where growth has been fairly rapid over the course of the last generation, although in the past five years, I would say six years, it slowed down precipitously, and I, I don't think it's conjunctural. I, I think it's hit a wall, and it may not be able to find its way out without significant structural changes. But the result of this slowing down of Capitalism has been slow growth of incomes, and that's been made worse by a global imposition of austerity by states. Normally, in a welfare or social democratic capitalism, 
If income growth slows down, it's complemented through redistributive efforts in the state. What's happened to working classes around the world right now, it, come on in, there's, there's space. There's chairs in the front, and you won't be able to hear much, and you won't be able to see my lovely face. You're standing outside. The double imposition of slow income growth and austerity has been absolutely catastrophic for working people around the world. And it's one reason we're seeing a resurgence of the far right, because of the frustrations with the mainstream system. So you're seeing a polarization in politics between a resurgent right, or one might even say a surging far right, and a slow but unappreciable growth of a new generation of socialists as well. Now, because of that, discussions of socialism are now um, in the air again, but they're different from what they were in previous cycles of radicalization. For most of the 20th century, if you said that you were a proponent of socialism, it was immediately understood to me you were a proponent of replacing the market or abolishing the market in favor of a fully planned economy. So whereas capitalism was associated with market dominance, with the despotism of the market, socialism was to be associated with a planned coordination of the production of goods and services. This was to be preferred for two reasons. First, it would abolish the anarchy of the market, and in so doing, all the waste, all the inefficiency that we know from markets when they are left to themselves. But secondly, because you abolish the massive inequalities, both in income and in assets, that accompany capitalism, you would also presumably abolish the political inequalities that came or rode on the asset, wealth inequalities. The thing about a democratic capitalism is that even though democratic rights are distributed to the population as a whole, political influence is not. Political influence everywhere reflects the underlying inequalities in wealth and income. And so the slogan, the, the one pithy way to understand democratic capitalism is that always and everywhere, inequalities in wealth translate into inequalities in political influence. And if that's the case, if you can take that as being a theorem, then a dramatic reduction in asset inequality should also result in a dramatic reduction in political influence. That is the inequality of political influence. So socialism, insofar as reduce, it reduced these things, would also greatly spread the equality of political participation. And hence, it would be more democratic than a capitalism was. Now, that was why so many, hundreds of millions of peasants and workers came to socialism across the 20th century. Planning was the slogan, the central guiding principle of the movement. By the end, Turn of the 21st century, this was no longer the case, and it's still no longer the case. And the reason for that is simple. The actual experience of socialism in the Soviet Union, in Eastern Europe, and indeed in China and Vietnam, did not fulfill the promise that had been made at the turn of the century that it would both be more efficient and be more democratic. In fact, it turned out to be less efficient and highly undemocratic. This turned a generation of people away from the idea of socialism and gave ruling classes enormous propagandistic advantages in the face of movements of working people, whether peasants or workers. Now, if planning was not to be the central guiding motif of socialism, what was? Well, one alternative was a more humane form of capitalism, and that's social democracy, the welfare state. And Whereas socialism had failed in many counts in the communist countries, interestingly, social democracy managed to fulfill many of the promises that communism had offered. The highest developed social democratic countries, the Nordic countries, Germany, in fact, had higher rates of growth than the free market economies, and were also much more democratic. Working people had much more political influence, both at the workplace and in the nation as a whole. Social democracy, therefore, experienced a resurgence in popularity at the turn of the century, even while communism was receding. Well, that was one alternative. 
in the last 20 years, even that has come under attack because even the social democratic countries have participated in the imposition of austerity and privatization on working people. There is now a global disenchantment with capitalist models, whether they're free market or they're social democratic. Or I should, I should say, the social democratic model still has a lot of steam. I would not urge its abandonment by any means, and it's certainly possible that it's the best we can do. So we, if it's in crisis of any kind, it behooves us to try to think about how to get out of crisis. But there is another model that is normatively appealing, that is morally appealing to people, and at least has a promise of some efficiency gains as well, and that is a model called market socialism. Now, what I want to do is start with an explanation or a description of why the problems of a centrally planned economy should be taken very seriously. Because if we don't take them seriously, we might just say, well, just like a car that's slightly malfunctioning, there's no reason to abandon it, you fix the car and you move forward. If the problems of centrally planned economies were not deep and crippling, then we don't have to worry about market socialism. But if the problems are deep and crippling, then we need to think about what market socialism might do, what it might be, and how it might be a preferred alternative if we seek to go beyond the social democratic variant of capitalism. So let me now start, let me lay out in a very abstract, very general way what I think are deep and abiding problems of a centrally planned economy, such that we should at least think hard about another alternative to it. I am not going to make the argument that centrally planned economies necessarily fail. I don't know if we have knowledge with that level of certitude. I do, however, think that the problems are quite severe. So I want to labor that, uh, lay out what those are. Now, a couple of salient points about centrally planned economies. Um, they all were imposed in countries that were exceedingly poor. And you might know, Marx had been quite confident that his version of socialism and communism would require a massive degree of abundance. In poverty, it would be hard to, in fact, successfully transition to a something like a communist or a socialist economy. So he was willing to entertain the possibility in his final years of correspondence with some Russian revolutionaries. But the fact that these revolutions where planned economies were imposed occurred in poor countries is important. It means that we have to distinguish between problems that we might observe that are specific to trying to plan in poor countries. And we would call those conjunctural problems. And problems that are intrinsic, which is problems that could remain regardless of where you try to unfold a centrally planned economy. So let me just go through the distinction between these. The conjunctural problems were quite easy, I think, to lay out. The first one was that everywhere where planned economies were imposed, they weren't even fully capitalist yet. So in Russia, China, in Cuba, in Vietnam, the by far the largest occupation in the country was the peasant economy. You cannot plan a peasant economy. There's just too many productive units. So before they could even think about having any kind of economic planning for redistribution, for growth, they first had to undertake many of the tasks that bourgeois economies had already undertaken, central amongst which was a transformation of the agrarian sector, not just from non-capitalist or pre-capitalist production to capitalist, but then even once it's capitalist, to move out of agriculture into manufacturing. This is something that happened, of course, with bloody effectiveness in, under Stalin, but it also happened in China. Uh, after Mao's death in the Deng Xiaoping era, and it's still happening, it's almost fully happened now in Vietnam and in Cuba as well. That meant that the task of structural transformation overtook the, chance, the, the task of socialist allocation and socialist development. Secondly, because they're exceedingly poor countries, the redistributive component of socialism was rapidly overtaken by its developmental aspects. And this is important because the key to development is raising your rate of savings. You raise your national rate of savings because your national investment comes out of your savings. If you want to develop rapidly, you have to massively increase your rate of investment. You cannot do that unless you have a prior increase in the rate of savings. Now, in order to have an increase in the rate of savings, you must 
suppress consumption. But if you're suppressing consumption, it means that you're basically depriving people of the very promise that they had been given with socialism, which was consistently raising their standard of living. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is that once the rate of savings is increased and rate of investment is increased, now the, this means that along, in order to make those investments pay off, you have to impose labor discipline. But imposing labor discipline means there is absolutely no chance of workers' democracy, of workplace democracy, workers' control, whatever these more ambitious promises were of socialism. In, that, in fact, what you had in the Soviet Union was the very opposite. And in the China soon thereafter, very opposite which is using the slogan of national development, of the, the enrichment of the people, in order to extract more and more and more labor out of its own working class. What you essentially have is a kind of socialist sweatshops. And it's so beginning with the Sakonovite movement, where workers were extolled to sacrifice for the motherland, the fatherland. And of course, in China, they were disastrous experiments like the Great Leap Forward, but within the Cultural Revolution as well, and prior to that, the idea of sacrificing for development overtook the idea of human flourishing, which was at the core of socialism. These were unavoidable. These were not mistakes. These are countries mired in poverty, where people's basic desire was for stability, economic security, and to be able to come out of the, so the situation of malnourishment and deprivation that they were in. They willingly prioritize development over all the other things. But that means that whether you admire, and there is much to admire in the Soviet experience and Chinese experience, whether you admire it or not, you will admire it primarily for its economic successes, not for its moving along the tracks of what Marx or his followers would have recognized as socialism. So even though there was tremendous suppression of the socialist impulse, and even though there was great success in the development of the economy, we would not call this anything like what in the 21st century most of the citizens of the world would like to see for themselves because given the current level of development in the global economy. Well, whatever these reasons are, the conjunctural facts, the facts specific to these poor countries, if they militated against socialist planning, they certainly are not relevant to the prospect of socialism in Europe today, in the United States, and even to most of Latin America and the Middle East, where the peasant population has basically disappeared. India is one of the very few countries in what's called the third world in which you still have a very substantial agrarian sector. The agrarian transition in most of what 30 years ago we would have called the third world is now over. So in much of those countries now where the left is coming about, the problems they face are not the same as those faced by the Soviet Union or China in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. So now we have to therefore at least uh, examine, at least consider whether the problems are intrinsic to a planned economy, and not simply conjunctural to poor ones. We have to see whether, even in a rich economy, if the problems that the Soviets faced and the Chinese faced would be transferred over to those wealthier economies. And the, much of the argumentation today is that yes, they would. The problems with those economies, and let me just lay out the economic history here. The Soviet Union did very well as a developing country, as did China from in the early stages of its communist experiment. So the Soviets, from about 1928, after the civil war is over, after the NEP is over, and you start the institute plan, from about 28 to about 1970, the early 70s, they're quite low. It's from the 70s onward that it really starts to stagnate. The reason for this is not uh, irrelevant. The reason is that from about the 30s to the 70s, it was still undergoing a transition from a peasant-based economy to an industrial economy. Because of that, its main challenge was simply to first release labor from the countryside and then absorb it in manufacturing. The rate at which it, it was able to absorb that labor was massive. But precisely because that was the main goal, technical efficiency, dynamism, and global competitiveness 
did not have to be the main thing they were uh, pursuing. All they had to do was lay down new plant and equipment, even at vintage levels of efficiency, not at benchmark low <coughs> levels of efficiency. So if you just took old factories from the 40s and 50s and just kept laying down new ones, you could absorb this labor. And that shows up as very high rates of growth. Once all that labor is absorbed, though, now, if you're going to have growth, it's going to have to come through what's called technical change. More economic dynamism, more reinvestment, new inventions, R&D. On that, planning failed quite miserably. And it was understood. The reasons for that are what I would like to examine now. Because if socialism is going to have a chance in the current world, where that structural transformation is no longer the main constraint, it's going to have to not simply absorb labor, but also continually innovate, continually bring about new inventions so that income starts to stagnate. If income starts to stagnate, socialism starts to lose legitimacy, even within its main constituents. All right, so what might be the reason that planning was unable to be efficient, to get mired in stagnation? Well, what is the main task of planning? It is, uh, I'm gonna, there's a huge crowd back there. Let me describe this thing. There's no point standing in the door, unless there's a fire, in which case it may move for me. <laughs> Uh, so much. Because. You really are going by car. Essential task of planning. It's twofold. One is to map the needs. Sorry to map what is produced onto the needs of the population. That's called an allocated problem. I have to decide from the pool of investable resources that the economy has, if I'm the planner, I have to decide where to invest those resources so that what is being produced is consistent with or maps onto what people desire. The second is that over time, I want to be able to produce more efficiently so that we are not just producing more, but we're producing it in a way that allows people to have more plentiful budgets, to have more varied lives, and to be able to raise their standards of living. So one is allocated efficiency, the other is called dynamic efficiency. You want to be a dynamic economy. Now, for this to even get off the ground, the first challenge that has to be met is the allocated part, which is figuring out how to map what we're producing onto what people need. In capitalism, there's a simple mechanism for doing that, which is firms project what they think they would be able to sell on the market based on what people want, and then they produce a whole lot of it, and they throw it out into the market and see if it sticks. If they guess correctly, they sell their products, and they see that profits are going up. If they guess incorrectly, they don't make their profits, and some of them go to the wall and go out of business. So even while there's no central planning, to this massive, decentralized, iterative process of trial and error, firms manage to come to what people might actually be able to consume or would want to consume. That still leaves a lot of people out, but rough and ready is the, system, is the best way to uh, figure out this dilemma that human history has uh, shown us. When you take away that market mechanism, how are you going to figure out what to produce? Well, planners need information. They need information as to what people want. Where will they get that information? Well, the idea is there's two ways to get the information. One is to look at habits. There's a lot of consumption that remains fairly steady across the years and is hence fairly predictable. How much electricity people are using, how many basic goods they consume, how much, like, uh, how much uh, what their transportation needs are, things like that. It, you can fairly uh, effectively predict what those needs are going to be. But then there's a whole lot of other stuff that you really don't know. So for that, the only way you get the information is through some kind of survey, some kind of input from the consumers themselves. And all forms of democratic socialism propose, and command economies also propose, 
Okay, consumers provide them with information as to what they would like to consume. Now, in a lot of the literature on socialism, the problem, the worry has been when there's so much information coming in, how do you process it? In the 30s and 40s, there were no computers. So they had to sit down with reams and reams and reams of, you might call survey data, and then collate it, process it, and from that, statisticians would send to the planners data on what they think needs to be produced, in what quantities, and how it will be spread geographically around the country. And of course, this was beyond their ability. They, they, there was no way they could do it. Now, if you think that the main problem is information processing, then of course I think the age of supercomputing planning should not hold great challenges. I think you can do it. You can have decentralized people get put in the information at home on their laptops. They don't even have to go to meetings. And the planners get them, and some kind of algorithm can process it and send it to the planners. Many of the current proponents of centralized planning or total planning say that with our information technology today, the problems of the Soviet style of socialism are easily overcome, and hence we should once again propose the old idea of a planned economy replacing the market economy. But what if it isn't just information processing that's the problem? <clears throat> there's good reason to believe that there's also an incentive problem not of the kind you would think of managers having the wrong incentives, but also incentives on the part of customers, of consumers. Consumers face, I think, two problems, which to my mind undermine the very idea of planning quite dramatically. So one is that consumers may not want to provide all the information as to what they consume, because there's some of the consumption choices that they consider present. I think all of you know what some of those consumption choices are, uh, which you would not want everyone to know for yourself. They all concern private forms of consumption, some having to do with sexual choices, some having to do with interpersonal choices. So they would not provide a lot of that information because they don't want to be known public, especially if it goes through meetings, where you have to tell your neighbor what you do in the evening in your spare time. So that means that there is a reason not to provide full information. You will under-report some of your consumption preferences. Now, if you're under-reporting your consumption preferences, it inevitably means there will be an under-provision of those goods. If there's an under-provision of those goods, the demand for those goods won't go down. What it means is that there will emerge a black market for those goods. That black market will undermine the planet. And this is going to be pervasive. We don't know how extensive it will be, but it will be pervasive. And that is necessarily going to be there in any planet economy. So first of all, there's going to be consumption choices that people are aware of, consumption preferences, but which they don't report, which is going to make the processing of information, even if it's efficient through supercomputing, unconnected to actual consumption needs or wants that people have. But there's a second, I think, much bigger problem, which is it is absolutely the case that for many people, they don't know what they will consume until they are given a choice. So first there's a privacy problem, then there's a problem of choice. And here's what I mean. You might say, I need about 10 shirts a year. Okay, that's under the current distribution of income and the current choice set in your budget between shirts and, let's say, shoes. Now, if your budget is changed and the menu of alternative options is also changed, that means your opportunity costs are changed. That is, for every choice that I make in favor of one thing, I'm giving up something else. The reason right now we can be told, be asked, what of X would you well, consume over the next year? The reason you might get anything resembling an accurate answer is, we take the background assumptions of our current choice set to be parametric. We take them to be given. But the fact is, in a new economy, until I know what other alternatives I have with my consumption, I cannot tell you how many shirts I'm going to consume. I cannot know until I know what my other choices are. I will not know what my other choices are until the planners decide what they're going to produce. But the planners cannot decide what they're going to produce until they know my choices, my preferences. This is a very, very severe problem, which means that people might notionally report what it is that they'll consume, but once they're given the actual 
list of items that are available after the planners have processed all the information, they may decide that they made the wrong predictions. In fact, I would predict they will always decide for a substantial set of their commodities that they made the wrong predictions. And because of that, once again, it means there will be a huge mismatch, even in allocative terms, between what's being produced and what people desire. But now let's follow this through a little bit. If it's the case that they change their mind on what they would like to consume, or that they provide an imperfect inf information, tell me if I'm going too fast, yeah? Mm -hmm. Don't hesitate to raise your hand if I'm going too fast. This is all very logical, but uh, we all know non-Western people are not logical. Mm -hmm. So if it's difficult for you, I will drown it down. <laughs> Just go to any uh, post-colonial theory department. <laughs> <laughs> That's your professor. That's what they all believe these days. If the proportions in which goods are produced are incorrect, what it means then, of course consumers won't get what they want, it also means that the Managers of firms, whether they're democratically elected managers or whether they're appointed by the state, managers will A, have excess supplies, things they were unable to sell. But they will also have shortage of inputs. They will not, because if demand is greater than the plan predicted for a certain commodity because people underreported it, it means that the managers will need to produce more then what the plan said, once the plan realizes that we were initially wrong, but that means they won't get the inputs that they need to be able to produce more. If that's the case, the initial targets that managers were given by the planners are either going to be overshot or they're going to be underproduced. They'll fall short of them. Now, if the targets, especially the targets, are not met by the managers, the managers are going to be blamed they will have to explain themselves as to why. Comrade, why did you not fulfill what the plan said? And this comrade will say, because you didn't give me my damn inputs. Now, it just so happens that that's true. So this means there's going to be two consequences. Managers, because they know that they cannot trust the dictates coming from the plan, and I'm, I'm saying this as if it's a prediction. What I'm doing is describing what happened in centrally planned economies, and, we're at, and the reason I'm predicting is I think it's built in. I think this is a matter of, I'm trying to explain it as a show it as a prediction, but I'm not, this is based, this is this is just prediction or guess. This is just dis, describing what's come out of a, a mountain of his economic and historical research. So you can put it in past tense if you're worried about that. Managers now do two things. First of all, they the plan not only gets information from customers about what they want, the plan also seeks to acquire information from firms as to what their productive capacity is. Planner cannot just say to firms, magically produce X number of shoes. It has, the manager has to know what the productive capacity of the economy is for shoes. If it's adequate to the consumption needs, you don't have to have new investment in the shoe sector. If shoes capacity is falling short of what the consumption needs are, you have to have new investment flowing to that sector. So planners need information not just from consumers, but also managers. Now, I already explained why consumers may not give you accurate information. Now let's look at managers. If managers expect that plan targets are not realistic, they will make their own judgments about whether or not they can produce what plans are probably going to ask of them. And in particular, if they feel that plans will overshoot, in other words, they'll ask them to produce something for which the inputs are not coming in, managers will underreport their capacity. So that they're not asked to do as much. In other instances, managers will over uh, report their capacity because they want to be seen as a rapidly growing sector, which means the demand is greater for that sector, which means they'll get more investment funds for themselves. Managers, therefore, just like consumers, have an incentive to provide the wrong information. Again, which means supercomputing can't solve this. It's an incentives problem of whether or not you're going to give the planners the, the information they need. Now, from the planner standpoint, once they know, and this is what happened in the Soviets, once they know that managers cannot be trusted with the information they're giving them, they seek to replace that information with information of their own. So what the Soviet Communist Party did was, it didn't just ask managers as to what their capacity was. It had spies. 
spies in what? In the form of ministries. All regional ministries have to have their own information collecting apparatuses. But um, this is, um, I don't want to go too far into this. That didn't work because the information collecting ministries had reason to lie to the planners because if they gave them accurate information, then chances are pressure would be on them to provide inputs and outputs in a certain proportion which because now nothing is matching what people actually want, the ministries themselves may not be able to fulfill what the planners are telling them to do. So instead of ministries solving the problem of information acquisition, they added another layer of misinformation. Here's the big message. In a, in a condition of uncertainty within a planned economy, and there is always uncertainty, in a condition of uncertainty, it's not just a problem of processing information that undermines the plan, but the very process of acquiring information. And the reason you cannot acquire the right information is people have direct material incentives not to accurately convey to you either what they want or what they can produce. The result was, the final cap in this, not only did managers not provide that the right information, not only were they producing goods in the wrong supplies, firms that were inefficient, that were not producing A according to the plan, but that were producing at too high a cost, could not be disciplined. The managers couldn't be disciplined by firing them, and bringing in more managers. The firms couldn't be allowed to wind down. Why? Because everybody could blame the plan. And if you can blame the plan, planners lose the legitimacy of imposing discipline on the firms. And this is one reason, not the only one reason, you got what is called the soft budget constraint, which is the most famous metaphor, or the most famous um, neologism as to what the problem was that beset planned economies, which is, in capitalism, you have what's called a hard budget constraint. Firms have a certain amount of profits. And with that profit, they can either stay alive, or they find that they don't have the money to stay in the market, and they die. It's a wall. The revenues that they bring in is a hard constraint on whether or not they can live. What happened in socialism was, well, there's no market, per se. The way in which you winnow out inefficient firms or corrupt managers is you fire them, or you close down the firm through managerial, through planners, big top, and you start up a new one. But if the planners lack the legitimacy to do what the market does in capitalism, what they'll do when a firm is underperforming is continue to give it more subsidies. So that they don't get blamed. And what you had there for in socialism was incredible waste. Because firms had no reason to be efficient. They simply had reason to continue producing and generating local patronage for themselves. Okay. So, if this is true, advanced capitalist countries will face the same problems that the poorer countries did. Because the problem doesn't emerge from a incomplete transition to capitalism, too many peasants, poverty. It emerges from the very attempt to replace the market or abolish the market and have an administrative administering of the economy through bureaucratic machinery. This is what much of the literature and the students of planning have now come to conclude. So for the left now, the choice becomes, is, let's for a second just take this, let's say the, this pessimism is warranted. Maybe it's not. And I certainly don't want to declare that planning is dead. I would say that there's good reason to believe that its problems are mighty and perhaps insuperable, but I'm very open to being convinced that they're not. I do, however, believe that with the three-quarter, the seven or eight decades of experience we have with planning and its problems, we should at least consider a different way of organizing a non-capitalist economy. We should at least think about what it might be so that there's an option. If, in the event that our, our skepticism towards planning turns out to be warranted. Well, the main um, attraction of market socialism is that it massively relieves the burden on planners. It doesn't eradicated. It still has some planning, but its scope is dramatically reduced. Why? Because in every market, in every model of market socialism, you have a public sector, that is to say state-owned enterprises, just like you have in socialism, uh, plan, centrally planned socialism, but you also have a substantial, to varying degrees, 
market set. That means that planners don't have to plan the entire economy, they just have to plan a, sec a chunk of the economy. They leave the rest of it more or less open to the market. That is one of uh, the commonalities across all the models of market socialism. And there are many such models. If we want to consider what market socialism is, we have to do two things. First, consider what they have in common, <coughs> and then look at some of the variations, and then see if the models that we know are consistent with socialist beliefs. I mean, you can have models of anything. But the burden on market socialism is to see that it's pragmatically acceptable, that it can solve some of the problems that capitalism has and that centrally planned economies have, but also that it's consistent with the worldview, the goals, the moral goals of socialism. Right? Okay, so what are the commonalities of market socialism as we know it moving forward? Well, the first, as I said, is a mixed economy, which you have a large public sector, and including banks. Uh, most models, most every, every model that I know of market socialism has publicly owned banks. You don't have private banking. Secondly, as I said, there are markets for many goods. Not everything is going to be centrally planned, especially consumption goods. Consumption goods are, to a significant extent, lent to the market. There's also a labor market. In other words, there's going to be, you don't, there's no central authority telling people where they have to work. It's absolutely impossible to do that. Socialism, they didn't even try. The centrally planned economy is interesting. There's an argument out there that these were never completely planned economies. They very rapidly became administered economies. But they weren't fully planned. And I can tell you a reason why. You can't have planning if you don't plan the labor market. All economic production, Marx famously said, and he's right, all economic production in every system comes down to the allocation of labor time. So if you're going to plan the economy, absolutely what you have to do is also plan the labor market and not just leave it up to movements and wages. They found very quickly that they were not able to do this. So in market socialism, <coughs> every model of market socialism allows freedom of mobility for workers, deciding which jobs they want, which jobs they don't want, and quite a lot of freedom to hire and fire workers as well. Okay, and finally, firms have to compete to survive. So they cannot be a soft budget constraint across the board. In most every model of market socialism, because there's a market and there's competition, you also have firms needing to uh, make a certain baseline level of profits to survive. So what do we have? We have a mixed economy, we have a market for many goods, we have a labor market, and we have competition. This solves many of the efficiency problems. But the worry is, how is it socialist? This sounds a lot like capitalism. So we have to look at the other side of the equation, which is how it's, we now just consider how it's not like a centrally planned economy. Now let's see how it's not like capitalism. First of all, there will be no individual ownership of these firms that are competing with each other and striving to make profits. No individual ownership. There might be other kinds of ownership. So it, it might be stable. It's perfectly possible to have all the means of production stayed on, but you tell the firms it's survival of the fittest. It's certainly possible to have that. There are other models in which the firms are owned by the workers. They're worker-run co-ops, and workers have some kind of property rights in those firms, but they cannot sell away those rights. If they seek, if the firm is dissolved, or if the workers collectively decide they no longer want the firm, it goes back to the state. So there is no individual ownership, which means there is no class of surplus appropriators. The capitalist class of appropriators. Secondly, profits cannot be hoarded by individuals. Profits are either going to be either going to be redistributed amongst the workers, or they're going to be taxed away. Now that redistribution amongst the workers doesn't have to be equal. They could, in fact, decide democratically some workers need deserve a little bit more money because they're more skilled, they're more important, they're, they contribute more, others deserve less money. You will still have some degree of inequality. But the important point is nobody has financial rights to the profits exclusively the way capitalists do. Thirdly, there will be a massive decommodified sector. And that's like social democracy. So when I said there's going to be a big public sector, a lot of that firms in that public sector will be providing things like transportation, healthcare, education, utilities, the media, and they'll be providers of public service, which means that 
there is no exchange, which means that the scope of the market is dramatically reduced, and people can lay claim to those goods as a citizenship right, rather than having to buy them on the market. But that also means, then, that the centrality of the labor market in people's lives is dramatically reduced. In capitalism, everything you need, you have to acquire on the market. And that's why capitalists can terrorize their workers, because the prospect of losing a job is so horrible. But if you know that, that's how this comes the number, 60 to 70 percent of all your basic needs are citizenship rights, now you have a great deal of security in life, regardless of how well your enterprise is doing, regardless of how well the place where you're working is doing, and you can even contemplate geographical mobility, shutting down this enterprise for another one, or something like that. Next, there is minimal wealth accumulation. So even though there's productive enterprises, even though there's some inequality, what you do not allow is people to have massive inequalities in assets, only four homes having one crore piece of the bank. Taxation takes care of that. What you will have, therefore, is income inequality, but not asset inequality, or at least will dramatically reduce the asset inequality. And on the back of that, finally, there's going to be minimal intergenerational transfer of wealth. So if I'm a really efficient worker in a firm, a worker on co-op, and my colleagues decide that I deserve higher income, higher wage than them, and I have savings over the course of my life, I can only give a certain small percentage of it to my children. You probably decide to allow people to give some percentage of it to their children because it's coming from their labor. But all labor is social labor. So they cannot keep it all. 80, 70, 90 percent of it will be taxed away so that every child that's born is born with a certain guaranteed fixed income that they have access to a certain share of society's uh, wealth and income that they have a guaranteed access to so that more or less you allow people to start from a common starting point in their lives. Instead of cap like in capitalism where some people, if they're born rich, they literally, there's no, there's almost no chance that they end up poor. Whereas if you're born poor, there's almost no chance that you end up rich. Where you are at the beginning of your life in capitalism basically decides where you end up. If you want a humane and a just society, that's the first thing you have to eradicate. How do you do that? Citizenship guarantees from the moment you're born for acquiring education, acquiring health, acquiring skills, for um, fairness of the job, and secondly, for the state to have enough resources from taxation, through taxation, that can redistribute to the people. That comes from taxing assets, taxing wealth, and not allowing intergenerational transfer of those things. All right, if this is true, then what we have is some of the practical advantages of capitalism through competition, to the dynamism, the dynamism that competition brings through a labor market, but also some of the uh, a way of avoiding some of the worst aspects of capitalism by dramatically reducing the effects of inequalities. All right, we can summarize that in the following way. It means that even though you have markets, even though you have wage labor, first of all, you don't have exploitation. Well, what is exploitation? Exploitation has two component parts to it. One is a coercive extraction of labor by one class from another. Secondly, that the exploiters maintain their livelihood from the labor of those people who they're exploiting. All right, well, in market socialism, we already said there is a dramatic reduction of asset inequality. There is a dramatic reduction of arbitrary power that property owners have over workers because we've said there will not be any property owners. And we've said there's going to be dramatically reduced transfer intergenerationally of wealth means you have done away with the kind of caste system that exploitation generates. You'll have inequalities, but not exploitation. Secondly, because you've dramatically reduced asset inequality, you will also reduce inequality in political influence. The state, therefore, will be lobbied effectively by many more sections of the population than a bourgeois state, in which the holders of assets have overwhelming advantages over others, and then use that state to reproduce their economic power, to guarantee the economic power. Here, instead, what you'll have 
is because you have a much more equally empowered citizenry on the economic domain, you will have a much more equally empowered citizenry in politics as well. And because so much of your material needs will be provided as citizenship rights through the public sector and through the guarantees that come to the redistribution of income and assets, it also means you will reduce dramatically the insecurity that capitalism brings with it. If I'm fired tomorrow, I still get most of what I need through the public sector, and in most market, models of market socialism, even though there is a labor market, the government also takes the responsibility to ensure everybody has a job. So if I can't find a job because I've bought my farm has gone under, I go to the local labor employment board or the local communis uh, the municipality board, and they help reassign me according to my preferences and my skills to a new sector. And if the private the private component of the economy is currently not absorbing workers, the state will has the, has the obligation for the public sector to absorb the workers. Which means that, on both counts, having a steady job and having access to the important goods of life, insecurity is dramatically reduced. So you have now eradicated many of the most morally objectionable components of capitalism. The exploitation, the insecurity, the oligarchy at work, these three absolutely uh, ineradicably objectionable parts of capitalism are now reduced. If the predictions are correct about the economy, you will also, however, have the dynamism that centrally planned economies did not. Let me just say why this is important. You cannot have a viable economy over time in which incomes are stagnant. It's not just because there might be other economies in the world where incomes are rising and people see all the goodies that the citizens, the workers have in those economies and therefore lose interest in or support of their market socialist economy or command economy. It's also because people's needs are not stagnant. They grow over time. Every level of economic development generates needs that weren't there in the other one because we didn't know we had them. If today, so I see a lot of you on your phones during the lecture, very rude. Uh, today, you all could not live without your smartphones. 15 years ago, you wouldn't have known you needed them. That's a new need. The needs develop over time. And that means incomes, the economy, and its productive capacity has to grow over time. Which means that you cannot have a degrowth economy. You can't have a stagnant economy. The, the issue of dynamism becomes absolutely central, therefore. And if market socialism bears out the promise that its proponents uh, declare, the attraction is that it, it avoids many of the worst aspects of capitalism morally, but it harnesses much of capitalism's dynamic efficiency, which centrally planned economies did not have. For a 21st century Marxism, therefore, if it's to lift itself out of the associations that it was encumbered with over the past hundred years. It is going to promise a, a kind of life, livelihood, future that we think people deserve. It is going to open up the possibility for human flourishing, which a socialism is supposed to be. It has to avoid not just the institutions and the experiences of the 20th century, but the dogmas that came with it. You cannot simply as a dogma pound the table and say, Planning is the only way to go, unless you can provide an effective argument as to how you avoid the problems and the inefficiencies and the oligarchic tendencies of centrally planned economies. Until you're able to do that, outside of your little study circles, nobody's going to come to you. The biggest problem we face right now is not simply the defeat of the left by capital, it's also the sequestering of the left to these tiny, minuscule, sectarian, self-absorbed, narcissistic, middle-class professional groupies, <laughs> where they simply don't give a shit about what anybody else outside their groupies says. It's about who's the purest. Until you confront the world as it is, until you tell, show them, and this is not just other middle-class people, working-class people, the first thing you go to a worker, they'll say, well, why is socialism? And if you say central planning, if he knows what that is, he'll have an image in his head. That's what the, the experience has been. You better have something to say. We don't know if Marxism is going to survive. This is a very exalted title, Marxism of the 21st century. I have no idea that there will be a Marxism in 2030. 
If it's to survive, though, it's going to have to be rational. It's going to have to be one that is open to all the problems of the past. And it's going to have to be one that takes the concerns of working people as its concern, not the concern of unhappy downwardly mobile professionals or aspirant downwardly mobile professionals, which are the two groups that exclusively dominate socialism today. Planning is at the very center of it. I hope this lecture helped. Thank you.